I'm going to talk about Western State College today, and it's my great pleasure to introduce all of you to Ashley O'Hara, the new curator of the Crested Butte Mountain Heritage Museum, taking over for Nell Burkett, who has moved on to a different career change. Ashley is from Summit County. She'll be graduating in about three weeks from Western with a degree in public history. So I'm going to turn it over to her right now. Ashley, you're on. Hi, everybody. Um, I am excited to be here tonight and just want to say thank you for everyone for joining the Crested Butte Mountain Heritage Museum uh, for our series. Again, my name is Ashley O'Hara and I'm the new curator at the museum. I'm really excited. Um, I would like to start the evening um, just by talking about um, giving a land acknowledgement. Uh, the museum recognizes that we are guests here on this land and historically Ute territory. We acknowledge that the Uncompahgre Ute and the Tabawash Ute um, were forcibly removed from this area due to the Bruneau Treaty. And we hope that you will take time to visit our neighbor, uh, the Ute Museum located in Montrose, Colorado, uh, with exhibits developed in partnership with the Ute Tribes by History Colorado, um, our state historic society. Uh, while we could never do this history justice, we do include information about Paleo Indians of the Gunnison Valley, the Ute people, and uh, the Bruno Treaty and the Los Pinos uh, Indian Agency in our exhibits. And we also hope that you will consider becoming members of members of the museum or making a donation to support this program and all the work that we do here at the museum. Uh, you can do that by visiting our website at crestedmuseum.com where you can call us up at the museum. Uh, this program is being recorded tonight and will be available at the crestedbuttemuseum.com and on our YouTube page. And if you have any questions about our programming, visit crestedbuttemuseum.com and find us on Facebook or Instagram or sign up for our newsletter. And we always list all of our events in the newspaper as well. And thank you to our lead sponsors, Western Colorado University Alumni Foundation as well as uh, Bluebird Realty and Bill Petros. And um, we'll have time for questions at the end of the talk. Uh, and you can please post them in the chat and the Q&A as well. And then we'll do the trivia right at the end. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, Dwayne, you're on. Thank you, Ashley. A few announcements before we get underway today. Uh, first of all, this will be our last session. This is number 12 on Crested Butte and the surrounding area. And I want to tell everybody that we will be doing the Colorado history class by Zoom, and that will start on September the 9th and be on every Thursday evening for 12 sessions at 7 p.m., same time as tonight, September the 9th. It'll be free, and all you got to do is hit CrestedButteMuseum.com, just like you're doing now to get on. And I intend to cover mining and, and ranching and railroads. It ought to be a, a, a great fun for all of us. I also want to thank our sponsors uh, who have done a great job in sponsoring this program. Uh, we will have a trivia question at the end. And whoever gets the answer first will get the Crested Butte book. We have 470 some odd people registered for this class and I really appreciate it. And we also want to mention that I asked everybody to consider donating to the Georgian Ruby Scholarship Fund to help out a young lady from Crested Butte who doesn't have a whole lot of money but wants to go to Western in the fall. And we've had a pretty good number of people check in. So I'm gonna give you the way that you can donate to the scholarship fund again. George and Ruby Vandenbush Scholarship, you either call 641-2237, area code 970, or you go to westernup.org, westernup.org. Today, the topic is gonna to be Western State College. And I know we got a lot of alums out there, so I hope you enjoy it. And I want to put a little plug in because Western State's library has 1,300 photographs on Western State College through the years. So here we go, the history of Western State. Western State began in 1911 as Colorado State Normal School. And that was a two-year college for the training of teachers. 
And there you get a good look at the first faculty and students. 10 faculty, 13 students there the first year. North Hall. Today, the north end of Taylor Hall was the only building on campus. Students stayed at the Levito Hotel or in private homes. 12 years later, in 1923, the normal school became four-year Western State College. In 1915, Dr. John C. Johnson, one of the original faculty members and a biology prof, used rocks to build an N on Smelter Hill. Later, Gunnison High School students replaced it with a G that's still there today. And there is North Hall, October 25th, 1910. Uh, the roof isn't even on yet. First building on the Western State campus. Also, in 1923, Dr. Johnson and Western State students constructed the W on Tenderfoot Mountain just south of campus. It was built out of rocks, 420 feet vertical, still the largest man-made college letter in the country and lit up every homecoming. And you get a picture of Dr. Johnson and the Western State basketball team, Colorado Normal basketball team, 1912. And I always wondered what in the heck that E stood for. And I finally found out on a little blurb in the paper, it stood for elementary normal school. So there's the men's basketball team in 1911. Also in 1923, Highland Village was built by Western State and Gunnison residents. 43 room cottages just north of Taylor Hall, each costing $300 to build and renting for $4 a week. And it was just north of the present library. You ever get a great shot of Taylor Hall, the north part of Taylor Hall, in the early days when there wasn't hardly anything around it? With respect to Highland Village, 75 people were housed there. The village operated as a town with a mayor and trustees. Without it, many couldn't, could not have attended Western State. The cottages were very cold in the wintertime with water freezing and nobody wanting to get up to keep the fire in the stove going. They were torn down in 1960. Also in the fall of 1923, a Western State football player named Buell Crawford suffered a broken leg in practice, developed blood poisoning, and died on his 22nd birthday. In his honor, Crawford Hall on the Western State campus was named for him when it was built the following year and became the Western State Gymnasium. During the first decade of his existence and for many years after, there's a good look at the Western State women's basketball team, 1912, with Dr. Johnson also the coach of the women. During the first decade of his existence and for many years after, Western State had a toboggan run, which came right off the top of Smelter Hill, which is now the top of Cupolo Hill above Mountaineer Bowl, and ran all the way down to where the president's house is today. It was a half mile run with great speeds reached and many never getting to the bottom. The Western State Clubhouse was built in 1924, near to where the College Center is today. Fritz Zugelder put in a great fireplace. It burned down, was rebuilt, and then moved off campus in the 1950s and became the last chance bar run by Leo Klinker. And I know a lot of you folks uh, hit the last chance. Now I'm going to tell you how the last chance got its name. Leo and Judy Klinker had two girls and Leo wanted a son. And Judy came up to him one day and said, okay, but this is your last chance. And that's how Leo named that bar the last chance. And alas, the last one born was another girl. So Leo wound up with three girls and no boys. Colorado Hall became the site of the Western State College cafeteria by the late 1920s and 30s. And 500 meals were served daily at 27 cents a meal. There you see some of the folks are kind of painting the W 
as it were. And that is Tom McKelvey, the guy on the left doing a little supervision. Taylor Hall, which was named for our representative, Ed Taylor, from the 4th Congressional District, now expanded. With North Hall, the original building, built in 1910. In 1919, Gunnison built South Hall as the high school. And finally, in 1930, the area in between, which had simply been a tar paper roof covering a basement, which joined North and South Halls, became Central Hall. And in 1930, we have what we have today, that's Taylor Hall. There's a good picture of Highland Village. The Western State Hiking and Outing Club began in the 1920s, started by industrial arts professors Rocky Rockwell and A.B. Capron. They traveled everywhere. Mesa Verde, Grand Mesa, Winita Hot Springs, Mount McIntosh, Signal Peak, but their favorite place to go was Quicks Hill. Now you got a great shot there, people, of a toboggan run off the top of Cupolo Hill. You can see Taylor Hall in the background, and it's going to wind up a half a mile down, and that's a pretty steep slope. The favorite place to go for the hiking and outing club was Quicks Hill, 20 miles north of Gunnison and on the Quick Ranch. There is a great shot of the top of Cupolo Hill. And they had a glassed in plate there that showed all the mountains in the background. And somehow that thing was taken down probably in the 1950s. So we're now at Quicks Hill. The club, the hiking and outing club would take a bus and cars to the area and then hike up the hill to the, in the winter time to ski and toboggan. And one of the legendary skiers on Quicks Hill was a guy by the name of Carl Easterly. You're looking right now at the Western State Clubhouse that became the last chance. And that's about where the College Center is today. Carl Easterly and the Hiking and Outing Club throughout the 1920s and 30s skied on Quicks Hill. And Mr. and Mrs. Quick loved the students and they'd provide him with hot chocolate and cinnamon rolls. And there is the Hiking and Outing Club, right at Quick's Ranch, up above, ready to go down the hill. One of the great things that I got out of the school paper was how the Western State mascot was named. And I'm gonna quote from the school paper. Although the Mountaineer is appropriate as a symbol for the nation's highest college, he was not designated as a symbol of the college until the late 1950s. Officially in 1923, the colors of the college were selected from, mountainous, from the mountainous countryside. Crimson was chosen for the color of the Indian paintbrush, which grew in profusion on or near the campus and the slate color represented the sage on the hill above the school. The fawn was chosen as the college mascot to represent the qualities of alertness, strength, speed, curiosity, grace, and sensitivity. In the late 1950s, the drawing of the rather dignified mountaineer was produced through a student contest and first introduced in college publications. So, the first mascot at Western was the fawn. It wasn't the Mountaineer until the 1950s. There we got a great shot of Quicks Hill. And this is a guy named Fred Brand going aloft in a toboggan in 1932. And Fred told me we were always a little afraid to go off of that jump, but nobody wanted to be chicken. He is going about 35 miles an hour and he's on the rise. And that was a tricky jump. Next slide. There is a picture of Western State skiers playing crack the whip on the side of Quicks Hill, which is pretty steep. Quicks Hill was dangerous in the schoolyard, much less on skis. One of the most beloved and important presidents in Western State history was Sam Quigley. There's the bus, ladies and gentlemen that took the hiking and outing club and other skiers up to Quicks Hill. Sam Quigley had done yeoman service as the head of the YMCA, 
in World War One. Go back to that one before that, uh, folks. I know I'm getting a little disjointed here, but here is Carl Easterly, an 18-year-old student from Gunnison High School, 1938, built up a jump and is doing a backflip. One of the first guys ever to do it in the U.S. A legendary guy, died in Frisco, Summit County, 1994, became a great friend. Now back to Sam Quigley, who had done yeoman service as the head of the YMCA in World War I, and he also aided in the Red Cross and Medical Corps. He was Western State President from 1919 to 27, when he was removed by a Colorado legislature and board dominated by the Ku Klux Klan, opposed to all Catholics, Jews, Blacks, and immigrants. The Klan dominated the United States in the 1920s, including Gunnison and Crested Butte. Ben Stapleton, the member, the uh, mayor of Denver, member of the Klan. Burning crosses on Lookout Mountain, Cupolo Hill, Chocolate Peak by Crested Butte. Klan marches in both towns. One couldn't have been elected dog catcher without Klan support. Pat Gratton was a great student and athlete at Western State College in the 1920s. And I'm quoting now from his daughter, Molly Fisher, who wrote me the following letter. After graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and History, Pat began teaching and doing graduate work at Western. There are dark moments in our lives as well as happy ones and Pat experienced one which was a dark chapter in our nation's history. In the 1920s, the Klan began to grow in power in Colorado, and the main targets of these bigots, with few blacks in the state, were Catholics and Jews. In Colorado, the Klan influenced and became prominent in the state legislature, school, town boards, police departments, and began to hunt for Catholics. They found a couple at Western State, and one of them was Pat Gratton. The heroic resistance of the president of the college, Sam Quigley, wasn't enough. And this fine student and athlete, much loved in the town, lost his job. Dr. John C. Johnson, biology department, also lost his job because he wouldn't be a member of the Klan but he went on to establish the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab in 1928 in Gothic, eight miles north of Crested Butte. And that laboratory studied mountain biology and brought in during summer some of the best scientists in the world. It's still there today, doing pioneering studies on climate change and high altitude research. Before he left, Sam Quigley had turned Western State into a great liberal arts school with an emphasis on teacher education and had a reputation as the Harvard of the Rockies. The liberal arts, which came from the Greeks and then were emphasized more in the great Italian Renaissance, included history, rhetoric, grammar, logic, music, astronomy, and math. As Quigley put it, anybody knowing the liberal arts was doomed to a life of success. The W was whitewashed for the first time in 1924 with all lime carried up by freshmen up the face of the mountain. And then they used melting snow on top for water. Four years later, a primitive road was built 4.1 miles to the top on the backside. Horses and wagons carried the lime and water then. For over 50 years, Western had a W day in the spring when students got the day off and whitewashed the huge letter with buckets of lime. The Depression 1930s were tough years for Western and the nation. Salaries were cut by 23%, but student enrollment increased slightly. Many students sought the low tuition rates and low room and board fees at Western that more exclusive schools did not have. From 1932 to 41, for the first time, more men attended Western than women. 
During the 30s and into the 40s, Western had a great president and one who served longer than any other in history, Charles Casey, serving from 1930 to 46. In 1934, at the peak of the Depression, a Western State music professor, George Damson, began the summer music camp. Damson would serve on the faculty for 37 years, from 1914 to 30 to 51. He had been a member of John Philip Sousa's famous band and had been a member of the Minneapolis Symphony. And there is the Western State Band during band day, or band camp, I should say. Damson brought in famous band directors and composers to campus. And there he is right in the middle with the line tie with members of the band camp coming from all over the United States, faculty and students. The camp was the largest in the West and brought high school students in from all over the nation. By the time it ended in the 1960s, he was bringing in over 500 students every summer and was known all over the nation. Two of the great faculty members of the 1930s were Hannah Praxel in PE and Clarence Hurst in science. Praxel had been an All-American field hockey player in Boston and was a great athlete. Hurst, along with Bill Ender of Gunnison, founded the Southwestern Archaeological Society, which involved 12 states. Both men had a treasure trove of artifacts. There's a picture of a guy we're gonna talk about momentarily, and that is the greatest athlete in Western state history, and his name is Pete Peterson. Next slide. Well, we gotta hold off on that one, uh, Ashley. I'm a little ahead of myself. One of the famous smokestacks at Western state, the smokestack at Western, which we'll see pretty soon, was torn down in 1936. 100,000 bricks made up that 100 foot high chimney and they were later used in the central service garage in Gunnison. The 1930s also brought in the greatest athlete in Western state history. And his name is Pete Peterson. You're looking at him right now. He was a giant for that time, six feet five. All conference in basketball, all conference in football, heavyweight boxing champion of Colorado. During World War II, he was a frogman, which is a Navy SEAL today. And after a reconnaissance mission in one of those Pacific Islands, he luckily made his way to the Pacific Ocean, was picked up by a destroyer. He came back to Western, served as head football coach from 1953 to 60 and then went to Cal Poly at San Luis Obispo in California and headed the English department there before retiring in 1976. He died in 1982. Another interesting event occurred at Western in the 1930s, and these were the ice carnivals that they had. And we'll keep that one on. That'll be the next thing I'll talk about. The ice carnivals were big in the 30s and 40s. In 1933, 2000 watched the carnival put on by the Hiking and Outing Club. It involved speed skating, hockey, figure skating, and obstacle course skating. A roaring bonfire on the north side of the rink where the president's house is today kept people warm. Hot dogs were served. Hot chocolate was served. And now we come to that interesting event in the 1930s. It's October of 1939, and Western State co-eds played a powder puff football game. The seniors and juniors were called the Lions, and the freshmen and sophomores were called the Bears. Fox Movie Tone News filmed the game, and it was shown all over the nation. The newspaper account declared, and I'm quoting, they were decked out in regulation helmets, shoulder pads, jerseys, and attractive shorts. Cameras click fast and furious. And that was about the only fast activity on the field. 
The seniors and juniors won the game 13 to 6. A few days later, Western got a telegram from Hollywood, and Western's women were challenged by the Chet Ralph Chevrolet girls football team. Life magazine wired to ask when the next game would be played so they could cover it. However, the girls decided they had had enough for one year, and they would devote their extra time they had from their studies to less strenuous sports. One of the annual events highlighting homecoming from 1930s to the 1960s was Mountain Doings. Now there, we're a little late on that, but that's that 100 foot high chimney. And I wouldn't want to be the guy to climb up. And you can see the guy on top. As I said, one of the annual events highlighting homecoming from the 30s to the 60s was Mountain Doings. These were skits put on by students and athletes before huge jam-packed uh, jam crowds in the gymnasium. By the 1960s, however, they became too suggestive and risque, and Dean of Students Ole Chosna shut them down. One of the great memories I have of that time was Dr. John C. Johnson coming back after 55 years and getting a thunderous ovation in Mountain Dunes in 1966. Wendell Welke came to Almont for the annual fish fry in July of 1940, and there he is. 10,000 heard him speak there during his campaign as the Republican candidate for president in 1940. His speech was telegraphed all over the nation. And as he flew out of Gunnison later that day, the plane flew by W Mountain, and Wendell Welke looked at the big letter and he said to the reporters on the plane with him, look boys, even the mountain speaks forth. The coming of World War II had a major impact on Western. By 1943, only 32 men and 137 women were enrolled. Athletics were suspended. Retired faculty returned to replace these people called a military service. In 1948, Mountaineer Bowl was constructed. Coach Tracy Bora told me that it took a lot of dynamite to blow up solid rock that was there. Sometimes the rock flew as far as today's college center. And there you see a newspaper account of the building of it in 1948. After 16 years as president, Charles Casey died in 1946, replaced by Peter P. Mickelson who had been the head of Trinidad Junior College. Enrollment now swelled with many returning veterans and Mickelson now began to put up buildings. Beckwith Hall, 1949, Gymnasium, 1951, Chapito Hall, 1955, Student Union, 1955, Kelly Hall, 1957, Chavano, Tiacali, and Hermosa Apartments, 1957, and then Escalante Terrace, 1961. Mickelson's last year's president was 1960. He then left for the University of Hawaii, having presided over a great building program and a big enrollment increase. One of the interesting parts of the building program was the purchase in 1947 of three surplus army barracks from Fort Carson in Colorado Springs. And there you see them. And you can see a fly fishing class out in front. These barracks were set up just south of Taylor Hall and used as labs for biology, physics, and industrial arts. They were used until 1962 when Hearst Hall opened. Joining the faculty in 1949 was Sven Wick from Sweden, and there you see Sven. He was a brilliant gymnast as well as a skier, and he would go on to develop the Mountaineer ski team into one of the best in the nation. From 1949 to 68, he became the father of Nordic skiing in the US, served as Olympic coach, and produced 19 Olympic skiers. He left the next year to open up the Steamboat Springs Touring Center, 
which is still being carried on today by his uh, daughter and granddaughter. As a person, professor, and coach, he was one of the greatest faculty members Western ever had. The 1950s at Western opened in a near tragic way. On November the 18th, 1950, a bus carrying the Mountaineer football team to Canyon City for a game against Adams State lost its brakes going down Monarch Pass. The driver fought to control it as it hit speeds up to 90 miles an hour. And he yelled at the players and coaches to shift their weight from side to side to hold the bus on the curves. Finally, it hit level ground many miles from the top of the pass and came to a stop. One player interviewed on an early TV program threw, said that he threw a suggestive book he was reading out the window so his mother wouldn't know that he died holding that dirty book, as it were. Western State went on in another bus to Canyon City and beat Adams State 35 to 14. Sadly, all of this foreshadowed a later tragedy. On September the 11th, 1971, another bus carrying Gunnison Junior High football players lost its brakes on top of the pass and crashed at Garfield, killing eight players and a coach. Beginning in the 1930s and continuing to the 1960s, Western State's co-eds had hours. Freshmen were required to be in the dorms by nine on weekdays. Sophomores, 9.30. Juniors, 10 o'clock. Seniors, 10.30. There you get a great shot of students registering in the old library. And that's how we used to do it. Not online as we do things today. In 1953, legendary Western State coach and now athletic director, Paul Frosty Wright, with help from Sven Wick, got the NCAA to adopt skiing as an intercollegiate sport. And Western was now on its way as a great ski school and hosted the NCAA championships in Crested Butte in 1966. And there you get a picture of the eight queen candidates 1955 in front of the last chance or of course the the old student center and they're right where the bell is we are redoing the bell today and soon it will ring today again when football teams win a game well into the 1950s western state co-eds vied with each other for titles including miss personality Miss Highway 50, and Miss Attractiveness, along with Homecoming Queen and Winter Carnival Queen. And in 1951, we had the great W Mountain Race. Sven Wick got that one as a training session for his skiers. And it's the oldest race in Colorado, dating back to 1951. 2.8 miles on the backside of W Mountain right to the top, 8,671 feet. If the 1950s was the era of the building boom, the 1960s was known for enrollment. In 1956, there were 884 students at Western. And now with veterans returning and the baby boom in full bloom, enrollment increased yearly until it topped out in 1976 with 3,315 students. There is the building of Kelly Hall, 1956. Escalante was built in 1961. And because it was built on the site of an ancient Ute Indian burial ground, anything from hangovers to failing grades were blamed on the curse of Uray and Chapita. Athletic success reached a peak in the 1960s with the great ski teams of Sven Wick and two NCAA national championship wrestling teams in 63 and 64 under Tracy Bora and the greatest Western state football team in history. OK Dalton's 1964 squad 
which played for the Division II National Championship in Missouri and lost by one point, 14 to 13 to North Dakota State. Socially, the outs party was the place to be in May in the 1960s, begun by education professor Roger Duncan, who got into a fight with the administration. The outs party began in 1966 with no administrators allowed, hence the name the outs party. It was held across from the Lost Canyon Resort the first year, then at the Fairview School up Ohio Creek. The Black Canyon gang played music on top of a hay wagon. Steaks and ribs were cooked. Beer flowed freely from many kegs and songs were sung. By the early 70s, over 500 people were coming and the outs party came to an end because with so many people drinking and driving, it became very dangerous. In the fall of 1966, three Western State football coaches and the pilot, Vince Noyce, were killed when their plane crashed in a storm in the hills near Powderhorn. They are returning from New Mexico after a scouting trip. The coaches were Jim Novak, Garth Yorton, and Bob Busia. There you see Tracy Bora and his wrestlers going off to compete in the national championships, which they won. Western got a jump in enrollment now as the top ski school in the nation when the Crested Butte ski area opened during the winter of 61-62. Students had skied in early years at Pioneer up Cement Creek, Cupolo, Quicks Hill, Rosman Hill, and even on Marshall Pass. But now they could ski on a tremendous mountain that even had a gondola to carry one up the mountain. Buck Kelly played the banjo at the beer stew during the winter of 62 and 63. He was a Western student and often remarked that the beer stew was where the women were all good looking, the beer always cold and the music hot. The beer stew had been a home on the Malensic Ranch. Buck Kelly went on to play all over the world and at international performances. One attendee declared, his precision, speed, and warm personality won the hearts of thousands. Buck Kelly also became one of the top stunt pilots in the world and was the featured aviator in the Flying Circus in Virginia from 1982 to 89. Sadly, he died of cancer early in 1989. There is a picture of Bill Knoxon, the winningest football coach at Western's history, myself, John Grodeski, the owner of the Red Dolly Pub, we'll talk about John momentarily, and Duke Iverson, the second winningest coach in football in Western State history. Duke Iverson passed away one month ago, a great friend of mine and a great friend to many. A personal story that I think I've told, John Grodeski was the first guy I met when I came to Gunnison in September 1962. I went down to Goads to have a beer, saw a picture of a ski jumper in back of the bar. We began to talk, and it turned out that John was from a town called Escanaba, which is right next to where I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. He became a great friend, great supporter of Western State students, died in a veteran's home in Marquette, Michigan, 1990, shortly after I visited him. And I visited him about two months before he died. President John Mellon took over from when Harlan Bryant, our president from 1962 to 73, retired. He was in for 11 years. Mellon took over 1973 to 1984. Along about that time in the middle 1960s, the top social group of the 60s and into the 70s were the Lusaben, it means seven in German, and the accompanying women's group, the TKDs or Tapakegade. They were famous for their parties. Go back to the original shot there, uh, Ashley, if you would. That's the 75 group at the golf course. Go to the next one. 
Here's the group I'm talking about. Now you can see the seven on Knickerbocker's shirt there. Bobby and Billy Schweitzer are in there. Our fearless leader, Eddie Holthouse, is there. They were famous for their parties, dressing up at homecoming and contributing to good causes at Western. Ed Holdhouse, now a major realtor in St. Louis, was the head man. The two groups have had reunions almost yearly since the mid-1960s, and they'll be here again at homecoming this year. And I'm very proud to say that I was the faculty sponsor of that renegade group. Let's go to the next photo. There are the women, the TKDs, with many legendary girls who I got to know very well. John Mellon is now the president. In 1984, he resigned after 11 years. Enrollment now was down a little bit. The graduate program had been taken away from us, and things were a little tough. But Dr. Mellon was responsible for women's athletics at Western. With the coming of Title IX, he moved decisively. Softball, tennis, skiing, basketball, volleyball, track and field and cross country all became women's NCAA sports. One of the great success stories in sports was football in the 1970s and early 80s. Bill Knoxon was the coach, 71 to 85 and turned a losing program into the greatest football era ever, winning 88 games and annually going to the playoffs. Knoxon won seven consecutive Rocky Mountain Conference championships. In the 90s, Duke Iverson's teams picked up where Knoxon left off, also winning RMAC championships and going to the playoffs annually. And as I said, Duke just passed away. There is a picture, 1975, of the water workshop that Dick Bratton on the right and I started. And this is a very famous photo because we got the great historian Dave Lavender on the left, and then the four governors of Colorado, John Love, Dick Lamb, Steve McNichols, Mrs. Helen Jensen, and then a Johnny Vanderhoof of Glenwood Springs. And then Gary Sherman was a student, and I can't remember the guy next to him, and Dick Bratton is on the right. Track and field and cross country emerged in the 80s and the 90s. The men won their first national championship in 86, and there they are. The women in 1990 at Kenosha, Wisconsin, and that'll be the next photograph. And there they are, 1990. The men went on to win eight national championships and the women four, one of the top dynasties in the nation. And then Harry Peterson, Jay Hellman, Greg Salisbury became Western State presidents after 2000, and they embarked on an ambitious building program. New field house, new college center, new dorm, Boric business building privately funded by Steve Boric and today's Paul M. Rady Engineering Building, made possible by a gift of $90 million from alum Paul Rady. The campus looks fantastic today. The Rady Building, partnership with CU in computer science and engineering. Western ranked by Forbes as one of the top universities in the West. University status is Western Colorado University now the only outdoor industry MBA program in the country, a great business program with the most majors on campus and the second highest in CPA exams in Colorado. So here is Western today, 110 years old, still going strong, beautiful university, high in the Colorado Rockies, great past in producing great teachers, outdoor education, student faculty ratio 17 to one, and a university as much a state of mind as it is a place. 2,500 students and a living outdoor laboratory in the Rockies. There are the old timers. We meet every September. There are the original 15. Harlan Bryant in the front. Oli Chosnes, Paul Wright, D.H. Cummins, Herb Doricott, Herb Binford, 
in the Harold Benford, in the back, Chuck Wright, myself, Tracy Bora, Paul Coleman, Bill Edmondson, Bob Cornier, and Bill Dorgan. And you can't see Bob Arnold on the right. Mickey Zaradka took the photo. So a personal comment as we end. It was a great day for me when I came to the Gunnison country to teach at Western many years ago in 1962. I came from a great area, the upper peninsula of Michigan to an even greater area, the Gunnison country. I would like to thank all my students and athletes through the years for what they have done for me and all of you who have allowed me to come into your homes for 12 weeks. They indeed have been golden days and years. Good luck to all of you who have been on board and I hope to see you this September. And there I am, ladies and gentlemen, this shows you that we never stop anything. I'm teaching on September the 7th of this year when we had a big snowstorm in the Gunnison country and I asked my students to come outdoors so we could take that shot. So now, we have the trivia question, and Ashley is going to tell you how to answer. First one to answer gets it. So if everybody could put their answers in the chat box, and I'll keep my eye on the chat box. Where's the phone? One second. Okay, and I'll keep my eye on the chat box for the first person to All right, here we are, ready to go. Everybody listen now. I want to know the seven liberal arts that Western is famous for. First person to get all seven wins the book. We'll await your answers. The seven liberal arts. We're getting comments, but no answers yet. Seven liberal arts. Put it on the chat box. I can see it maybe. Ashley is waiting with bated breath. <laughs> Someone says. Sarah Gray says, too hard of a question. Ask a new question. <laughs> well, we got a bunch of answers. None really are getting it. All right, here's the second question. Everybody listen up. We ready to go? Here we go. Oh, I think we have one. Barbara says history, rhetoric, grammar, music, astronomy, math, and English. Um, that is very close. Very close. Reed says grammar, rhetoric, math, philosophy, English, and logic and music. No, don't have it yet. I'll tell you what we're gonna do. If anybody gets that, we're gonna give two books out. Here's the second question for another book. Everybody listen now, first come, first serve. I want to know the name of the greatest athlete in Western State history. Oh. Who said Pete Peterson first? Ah, uh, we're getting a lot. Um, let's see. Someone did, I think, answer the first question right, but the first person to answer the Pete Peterson is Teresa Parco. Okay, Teresa, make sure that we get oh, your. Wait. Yeah, that's. Hold on. There's somebody. Conrad, you were good, but uh, maybe not that good. <laughs> um, I can't see the name. Um, it's right above. Well, let's go to the seven liberal arts again. We had somebody that was very close. Yeah. Let's, so let's see if we can get the seven liberal arts. So it was JBYB, um, history, rhetoric, grammar, logic, music, astronomy, and math. Got it. Okay. Give that man a book. Okay. And then. And who got Pete Peterson first? It was Bill Greason. Bill Greason. Okay. Now, folks, we can go to the chat box if anybody wants to chat. I hope that all of you will consider donating to the Georgian Ruby Scholarship Fund so we can take care of that young lady who's busting her butt working a couple of jobs while she's going to high school 
so she can come to Western. All you got to do is call 641-2237 or go to Western Up. And I hope all of you can get on board September the 9th, Colorado History. Joel, they're not dropping the music degree. They've agreed to revive it for two years. The old photo of the old timers was taken in 1975. Quicks Hill, Q-U-I-C-K-S. Anybody else want to get on the chat board? Fire in. Thank you, Lisa. We'll see you in the fall. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, Mitch. Any questions anybody has? Thanks, Sherry. Any questions? Uh, give them to Ashley. Ashley, do we have any? Um, I'm not seeing any. You know, uh, I can see them on the. Oh, wait. Uh, Here's one. Um, How many national championships did you coach? Yeah, twelve. Eight for the men, eight for the men, four for the women. Uh, one of the other questions was how many of the old timers of the original 15 are alive? And I, I sadly have to say I'm the only one. I was the young fella at the time. Thank you, Donnie. Yes, I did, Kay. I got a lot of Bob's old photographs. Yeah, Carol, I got acquainted with all those old timers and uh, I am the custodian of their information. The Bay of Chickens is called the Bay of Chickens because sage hens were out there before the reservoir. Any other questions? How big is the campus in acres? Boy, I'd be taking a guess. Oh, what about Movet Spring Fest? Yeah, Movet uh, Spring Fest, that was a big one. It was really big when we were on the quarter system and didn't get out of here until late May. They still have it, but it's like the old gray mare. It ain't what it used to be. And then someone asked, how many students are at Western now? 2,500, give or take. And then another question is, how did you discover Gunnison and working at the college? You know, I, I discovered Gunnison when one of the graduate students at Oklahoma State came back, said he was offered a job at Western, but he didn't take it because they weren't going to hire his wife with him. So I just put my name in and jobs were easy to get and never seen it before, never been West before. Serendipity, got lucky. And then another question is, um, can the public take historic tours of the campus? Oh yeah, I just see the admissions office and they'll line you up. We had one more question. Uh, they wanted to know about the scholarship and then I'll give you the information again. We had a question about that. Okay. Either call the foundation office at 641-2237, area code 970, or go to Western up and you can do it online. And then we have a couple more questions, Dr. Vanden Bush. We have, um, how was this year's plow shank? As I'm assuming that's what that. It was fantastic because we got very lucky with the weather. We had probably four times the amount of people that we ordinarily would have because we can't get them all indoors to a polka party. But now we're in two blocks on Elk Avenue outside of Cochevers. We must have had three or 400 people dancing the polka on the main street. But the temperature, unbelievably, was 60 degrees. That doesn't always happen on May 31. And then Karen asks, uh, what are you planning next? Well, planning next for, with the uh, Colorado history this fall. And I'll be teaching again this fall. If you can believe it, this will be my 60th year. 60, 6-0, I'm old. 
Um, David and Judith are just asking uh, one more time on the donation information, please. Yeah, I already gave it uh, to them again. Okay. Six four one two two three seven or Western Up. Um, what has been your best experience being the state historian? Well, the best experience I think is representing Western Colorado and Gunnison and and Western Colorado University and trying to do things for the Western Slope that hadn't been done for a long time because for a hundred years, all state historians came from the Eastern Slope. So I've been doing podcasts that emphasize this area. Um, what's been your favorite memory while at Western? Well, a lot of great memories. Skiing the powder, Crested Butte. I just was in the Black Canyon today with a good friend of mine named Dave Nix, hiking down Kirikanti Creek, dropping down about a thousand feet to fish. The Black Canyon was my stomping grounds. But the greatest memory is all the great people that I've met who had such a great influence on me. And believe me, I needed a big influence on me. Um, can you tell us about the Vietnam vets who came to campus in the 1970s? Yeah, I remember them well. You know, they, they, you had to treat them a little differently because those men and women had been through a lot. And they, uh, they gave a lot to the Western State campus. And I learned a lot from them. And my views on the Vietnam War probably changed a little bit. And then it looks like this might be our last question. Um, how are state historians chosen? State historians are chosen by the State Historians Council and History Colorado, which is the State Historical Society based at 1200 Broadway in Denver. Oh, and then over in the Q&A box, there are a couple more, there's just a couple more questions. Um, some, Annie says, in the 1970s, there were Vietnam vets, some were friends, what can you share about the Vietnam Vets Clubs? Well, the, the Vietnam Vets Club okay. it was called Mu Vets. And uh, Kappa Delta Mu was made up of a lot of local uh, students from Gunnison and then it merged into the Vets Club. And they had a lot of great parties, as you might expect with veterans coming back. Um, Christy asks, what episode do you talk about Pitkin? In what episode? You well, it was, the, the episode that I talked about Pitkin was the, were the five great silver camps. And they're all on tape and that is the title. So if you wanna see that, just ask Ashley and it's on tape. Pitkin, Irwin, White Pine, Gothic and Tin Cup were the five big ones I talked about. And then last question, unless there's no more in the other box, um, oh, there is a couple more. Um, history of Signal Peak. Yes, the, the history of Signal Peak is simply this. They called it Signal Peak. It was originally called Squaw Peak, but it was renamed Signal Peak because the Ute Indians would be on top of that peak with smoke signals, signaling people in the nearby area. Hence the name Signal Peak. 9,200 and some odd feet high, towering over the campus. Um, when did the Klan lose power? Klan lost power towards the end of the 1920s. And they lost power because of courageous newspaper editors who began to write about the village idiots. And also because they got these guys on income tax evasion. They wanted to know why they weren't paying taxes, all the money they got in and, and all the property. And they couldn't say, well, we got it from murder and we got it from extortion. So they put him in jail like they did Al Capone. Um, good and riddance, bad rubbish, my mother used to say. What is the name of the podcast you hosted? Of the podcast, I, well, I, I hosted 12 of them. I don't know what the, give me a little more information on the question. Um, that's just the question. Um, I can go to the next one if they wanna write something in chat. Sure. Do people still honk at the yellow house on Monarch Pass? Absolutely, I never miss it and nobody ever misses it. You gotta wave and honk. And if you don't, it's very bad luck. 
Robbie, you find all the podcasts by CrestedButteMuseum.com, and Ashley will put you in touch with whatever you want to see. Exactly. Yes, yeah. you can access the podcast. Karen, thank you very much for the comments. I see your sister and brother-in-law all the time at the Almont Resort area. Yeah, I think that's it for questions. I just want to say um, thank you to everybody who is joining us and um, thank you to our sponsors, Western Colorado University Alumni Relations, as well as Bluebird Realty and Bill Petros. And I hope everyone has a great night. And we'll all see you on uh, in September. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Van the Bush over and out.